Welcome to the first. You have a story. If you look back on your life, you've done things for the first time that no one in your family, in your town, in the country has done. This is Dr. Sandy. You have unknowingly paved the way for others without knowing it or even acknowledging it. This is where you tell your story so that those who come after you can walk in your footsteps to build their own firsts. Hey everybody, today I'm speaking to James Owen Roberts. Exactly who's James Owen Roberts? He is an amputee empowerment coach. He's the host of the Mindset Athlete podcast. He's a TEDx speaker and author. He has over 15 years of experience in exercise, diet, and mindset as a coach. He's a two-time Paralympic athlete and an alum of both Swansea University and the University of Chester. James was born without a femur. You know, a femur is the thigh bone that is the longest and strongest bone in your body that allows you to walk. His mom was told he would never be able to walk. But James has defied the odds and learned how to swim butterfly strokes at a young age to build his upper body strength. James had academic and socialization issues during primary and secondary schools, but came into his own in high school. Because he was told he wouldn't amount to anything, he was afraid to apply for college. Even more self-doubt crept in when he was dropped by the British swimming team. Now look at James. He is retired from sports at 26. He did finish college or university. His purpose is to motivate others, and he's made it his mission to help fellow amputees to get and maintain their fitness. Please welcome James. Good morning, everybody. Today, I'm speaking to James Owen Roberts. And James is an entrepreneur. He's an amputee empowerment coach. He's a trainer, and he's also a podcast host. So James, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and tell, let our audience hear all about you. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the introduction, Sandy. A little bit more about me. Uh, I grew up to two parents in the armed forces. Uh, my father was is now a retired uh, U.S. from the U.S. Air Force, and my mother was a is a retired NATO civilian. So I grew up in um, a very I'll say pe- peculiar because it's it's like nothing else. Yeah, I don't uh, know but, if it's peculiar to people who are in the military, though. Not to them, because that's obviously that's normal. But for everybody else, it it's yes. for changing, well, friends and things like that. Every yeah, three, yeah. two, three years, maybe five years at a push, can be very. Well, you get used to it, but it can be very challenging. Uh, whereas I, I resided in one place for uh, nineteen years, so I I went through all my schooling and graduated in the same place. Whereas that's abnormal yeah. so when i say it's pe- pe- peculiar it's i grew up in a multicultural environment so for me to be uh, respectful of others it, it comes second nature I, I i came home i think one day at the age of five or six and we had a uh, that particular day and an italian mp to do the to, to help the kids cross the road so i came home and said i to my mum, ciao, ciao bella, like like it's nothing. So so picking up languages for me was very easy. So I, I like you said, I I, I have become an an amputee empowerment coach. It's been an evolution, really. Uh, like transitioning from retirement from high level sport to to going into to personal training and and then coming on the online online space and then transitioning from there to become what the audience wanted me to do because i i gave them the choice i think quite recently this year as well what do you like the sound of better transformation or empowerment and they picked unanimous unanimous unanimously with the empowerment but that's what i wanted to do anyway so i like the sound right that's fantastic so 
Uh, and I think one thing you missed off the introduction, I had recently, as of... Oh, this is the difficulty with the, the pandemic, you lose track of what year it was. I think it was last year I did a TEDx talk. So, for me, that was probably on the bucket list. It was like, That's on well, my bucket list, too. It, it was <laughs> the next... I called it my Everest, because I was trying to find something purposeful that would be on par with my sporting uh, prowess that I did. Um, and it was actually probably more difficult than the sport was to, to actually fulfill. That's, uh, that has been a goal of mine, and it's still on my bucket list. I have not time to really fully prepare for it, but it's going to happen. I know that. And where? what is the name of your TED Talk so people can look it up? Uh, mine, I did it on Motivation Has Had Its Day. Motivation. Probably not an ideal to have done it last year when people were seeking to probably the alternative of I want to find motivate. I want to find motivation. So it, what I've done is it more for when people have come to me and said they've lacked motivation. I've done it as an alternative. Well, go watch that and that might change your perspective on right. what, is, what is motivation. And obviously since then I've, I've done lives where I've focused solely on like mindset around uh, building a stronger mindset, um, tackling the inner critic, uh, what's the other one? Um, all around like mindset, but giving people the why as opposed to the, everybody wants to know the how, but if I give you the why as why is that coming up for uh, being uh, problematic, you you are able to obviously overcome that yourself because you, you yes. feel more aware of, okay, I'm doing this, 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 this could happen. So whereas motivation, when that doesn't happen, is nowhere to be seen. So it, 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 it was given, I think I've tied it off nicely and it's like a parcel now. I can give people three, four different things on motivation. Okay, go away. Technically, they're all the same, but they're coming at it from a different angle. Yeah, I know Simon Sinek has a, a great uh, talk on your why also, and that's very, very important to understand your why. So kudos to you. I, uh, are you the first amputee in your in your family? That I know of, yes. Uh, probably, I, I think I'm the 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 only disabled person. But I think my grand grandfather sat on some. Was it my grandfather? One of my relatives in a conflict sat on uh, um, a piece of coral, and it actually probably saved his life because he was able to get rid of the the the, the poison. Yeah, one my grandfather, my great great grandfather before the First World War. That's probably what saved him because it it helped to get the the boil out and, and bring out the poison. So other than that, as far as to my knowledge, I'd say I probably yes. And so how how were you? How did your family treat you as an amputee? Uh, no different than anybody else. Um, my, my family is very. I I I did. I did, if I backtrack a little bit, Sandy. I did ask my mum last year because I was curious about the adversity that they faced. So I, I had a bit more of an intrigue. Um, so my, my outlook on it originally was, well, they treated me no differently. And it was almost as if it was a, a single swim mentality or being thrown to the wolves. You're gonna, we're going to see if you can survive in an environment that's hostile to a certain extent. And... Well, obviously, I have because I've I've had I've had my scrapes, I've had my my bumps like any other kid, and, and obviously I've come up the other end. Whereas if it, the the alternative would have happened, and I was wrapped up in cotton wool, things would have been a little bit more difficult. So if I backtrack to what I asked my mum last year was, how was it for the other for the other family members? My grandmother was a little bit more morbid. Than I ever thought, because uh, she was of the mindset of is James going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life? How is he going to? She she never portrayed that to me as as long as she was alive. I never I knew nothing of that. Thing for her, 
right? That was an internal feeling for No, her. she she said that to my mum, but obviously they never discussed that to, to, to yeah. me growing up and on 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 very much uh children are malleable. If you don't tell them something negative, it's not they're not going to experience it. So for me, I, I was I was pleasantly surprised as well, I about thirty four years old to 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 hear that and to to see that she felt that certain way, but turned the other cheek to kind of give me the best way in life as could be because ultimately. I, I don't know. I shared that last year on, on social media, and people were in tears. It's like, well, I've just re- I've only learned of this in the last five minutes. Yeah. So for me, it's it's no it's I've got no skin in the game, and it's if I use Jay Z's uh, song of you know, dirt off your shoulder. For me, it's it's so yeah. small and insignificant. It's no big deal. It, it, it I the I never knew it. We never discussed it. So for me, it's 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 not it's no big deal whatsoever, and I move on. That is amazing that you even had the courage to ask her, because a lot of people just wouldn't. They just take it for granted, and they just wouldn't ask that question, right? I think I think obviously having discussions like this on on your podcast, other podcasts, it opens it up, and it opens my mindset to be maybe well, let's. I'm being asked about the adversity question as it relates to me. Let's let's go to another level so people can experience. Well, how did how did my exter well my my inner bubble and my support man deal with it? Because ultimately that's going to be a little bit more difficult because they're adults and people are going to be judgmental on the external or towards them, whereas I would probably none the wiser growing up. I don't know, say. Between the ages of probably the latter six years, I'll probably be able to re- recall some of that information. But any younger than that, I, I probably wouldn't me- remember things unless you t- said this occurred when you were this old, and kind of and, and kind of go, okay, you've maybe had it even worse than I than I, than I ever did. I I was probably my own worst enemy. That's about it. Um, I presumed people thought things differently of especially when I was a teenager I presumed that I put in thoughts into people's heads that I perceived they had and they didn't that's interesting because kids usually when they see someone that's different from them have a reaction right because they're used to people looking the same way or being able to play the same way and so they normally have a different reaction. So what did you experience from from young kids? I think growing up in that environment, I come back to the military environment, there's going to be a lot of differences. There's going to be people of different um, cultures, different nationalities, different races. So I think they're a little bit more, and I'm going to j- j- throw out a g- generalist statement now, probably more receptive because... Everybody looks different. Everybody's changing every two, three years. So you can't have that idea of not embracing other people because that could be you on the periphery. So I think my environment of growing up there, I know people knew probably I was different because of the, the, the physical disability is obvious. It's, it's, right. I think kids are, are very, kind and be can be very cruel but but most of my i still speak to them to this day my my best friends when when i was growing up they looked out for me to a certain extent and if anybody looked to i'm gonna say tease not bully they'd chase after them for me and bring them back that was probably like towards the end of elementary school and primary school but they didn't judge me based on uh, my limit, my lim, my lim, my limitations. It was we like James for, for who he is, and we're gonna in, accept that. So I think that's amazing. Prob- without probably reading into it, they probably are certain to a certain extent. They probably see as uh, there are 
frailties that could maybe take advantage. I, I was probably very wise. I, I, I'm, being an only child probably helps. Of I probably grew up a little bit quicker than some people. So I probably wiser beyond my years. So I was probably of the mindset of, well, I know this disability can be taken advantage of. Let me limit some of that by, okay, if I play soccer, I'll go in defense or I'll go in goal. My my ability is no longer a, a liability. It's I, I know that I'm going to have... <laughs> People could have the opportunity to ring, run rings around or run circles around me. That's not going to happen. So I, I'll probably be very wise. Or if we were to play basketball, play half court. And so I'm very clever, even at a young age, to kind of go, well, let's let's make the space smaller. Yes, you're gonna you're gonna be able to beat me in some you know, things from an agility perspective. But that's about it. You also said you you went into swimming very early. And that was your mom's idea? Well, for swimming, it's relatively late. I went in at 11 years old. Uh, yeah, that was my mom's idea uh, of trying to find a sport that the disability is not a disadvantage. So, American football, for flag football, no chance. <laughs> Basketball, no chance. Unless I stayed at one end of the court, but... Nobody but they have somebody. wheelchair basketball, and they have different... Yeah, but I did, back then, I didn't know that. Even though there's a picture behind me, back then, I didn't know it even existed. I, 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 the, the, the whole Paralympic movement, I, I, I somewhat knew about it. Um, and we're talking about, I think, uh, in this country, for a two-week uh, a, a movement or event, it had a two-hour two highlight reel. That was it. And that's like, so, and I speak to um, my butcher basketball coach now. He's a he's a fellow Paralympian as well. And he, when he was growing up, there was no coverage whatsoever. So things have moved dramatically in my lifetime. We're only talking about 35 years. Uh, I've moved very, very fast. Um, but we probably may have an even, well, I'll probably, Possibly or po probably wouldn't be having this conversation if I'd have chosen to go into wheelchair basketball. No guarantee that I would maybe have not made uh, the Paralympics anyway, but going into that route, um, I think dominoes and things just happened. I don't think, I, I'm not, I'm, there's an element I would say luck, probably would say other people would disagree, but there was a lot of things that happened and I had to be in the right place at the right time to actually for those to materialize. And so what were some of the things that that you really enjoyed as a, you know a young person? Well, that pretty much brought you joy, you know. Pretty much everything revol revol re revolved around sport. Almost everything <laughs> until I got to um I think family started to get a little bit annoyed with me. It's like, oh, that's all you can talk about. Can you yes. not talk about something else? That, <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm going to I'm going to have to get a little bit more more educated here because I'm passionate about it. It's almost to a certain extent an obsession negatively. And why I say negatively is because obviously if people don't want to hear right all the time, twenty four seven. But I lived and breathed it. it was my my friends. Sporty, uh, I did sport. I watched sport. That's not almost... so atypical, James. Men in general speak sporties. They have their own language, and that's what they talk about. It's really not that atypical of men to talk about sports all the time. I know my husband does all the time. The other thing, he's also ex-military, and I hear about the military all the time so it's, it's not uncommon at all so yeah so that's what i think so if i answer your question correctly it probably what brought joy was well health and fitness really being healthy uh but i would have probably back then called it sport and so what were some of the things that you found difficult or was there something that you found difficult to either do or wanted to do and you just felt you couldn't achieve that? 
I think it was adjusting to having the disability. I think I was about or preteen coming into middle school, well, that high school. And obviously, when I was younger, breaking my prosthetic leg was no big deal. It's like, oh, I've broken, broken my leg today, I get missed from school. But that became problematic the older I got because it's like, well, I'm falling behind here. Now, this is a liability. It's, it's, it's very inconvenient. It's like everybody else has got the luxury of, well, I'll say the luxury. Unless they break a limb, they're not going to miss school. So for me, that was probably the start of negatively looking at myself of, well, why can't I be normal? Why can't I be like everybody else? Um, and I, I obviously, well, later on in high school, I wouldn't wear, I wouldn't wear, sh- wear shorts in the classroom. So I'd be okay, comfortable in a, p- in a physical educational setting, which, Right. It baffles me to this day that that's possible because that's exactly the the, the the people are exactly well, for the majority are exactly the same. So why would you have one not have one problem in one arena and have a problem in the other? So but for me, so for me, I think it was my sophomore or junior year in in, in high school. So I was about sixteen, seventeen. And I kind of went, this is utter ridiculous because the only person this is affecting is you, James. Yeah. Wow. So you so you need to have, but that for me is is, is is adversity. But it's so it's so minute and it's not that difficult. So like it's an easy fix. Yeah, and but you just, James, you a lot of people, on. a lot of people don't look into themselves like you did. I mean, that's uncommon enough. People don't really take the time to do the inner work, like you did, to say it's only affecting you. A lot of people don't go through that process. That's unusual in itself. Oh, I think I probably downplay it as well. But I think cause it, because it's it's a physical thing and only I can experience it, it was, well, I've got a problem with it. So how easy is it to fix? Oh, I'll just change a bit of color. I, I say change a bit of color. It, I still would sweat even if we were wearing shorts anyway. But that that is probably the downside of, wearing, of having the prosthetic, that's about it. If it's too hot, you're gonna sweat more, and you need to, need to. I've got so much experience now. I, I can I can grin and bear it, and and be able to deal with it. But Do for, you wear for shorts now, I pretty much wear them. Uh, I've worn shorts all winter, which people probably think I'm crazy. I, I might have worn trousers. I could probably count on one hand in the last six months. Wow. Is that because I, you're training? You're in the health. Isn't that because you're? Well, you're it's, it's probably co- it's probably comfortable. It's it's that that is my natural. I'm wearing shorts underneath the desk, but it'd be my natural get up anyway. And and people working in a in a physical sense, be it coaching, personal training, um, potentially in a sporting management role, you'd be in tracksuit some right. sort of tracksuit anyway so i've spent a lifetime like that but it's evolved to to the point where i've got nothing to hide if you want to ask me a question i've got no problem with it uh depending on whether or not i need to get somewhere in a hurry that would be probably the <laughs> only occasion where that would be a problem as well okay you've got five minutes to ask me a question because i need to get here on the dot um but no, I, it was one of those things. It's 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 probably opens conversation because if I'm wearing it, okay, the winter's not been that cold. Be it, it's like below zero centigrade, not Fahrenheit. People will probably look at me and well, how why are you able to do like that? It's like well because I've become comfortable being uncomfortable. It's it's I've gone beyond the, the leg and 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 gone into you know, ice baths, cold showers, right. and really experiencing discomfort. Uh, so, you know, temperature for, because we've got a dog now, so I've got to walk uh, a little bit more, and I do the last one at night. It is cold. So it's like, well, I can't where, change where that. Are you? Where are you now? Uh, North, North Wales. So I'm about 30 to 45 minutes away from, Chester in England and in the other direction about 45 minutes from 
uh, Mount Snowden, which is the second highest mountain in, in Britain. So wow. it, uh, it, it's uh, as I keep saying wow because it's I've I've gone to London. That's about you know the London area. My family's. From. Well, I, I I used I used to live in London for a bit. So it's for, for where I live now, and that is pretty much night and day. It, it's this is. <laughs> Uh, well, it's where my mother grew up. Um, I came here for all my vacations and holidays until I became a teenager. My aunt lived in Manchester, so I wanted to go to the big city uh, when I got older. Um, and I prefer this lifestyle a little bit. It's a little bit slower. Um, people are, well, I think it's just a northern thing in general. Bit more polite. They will ask how you're doing, and people will stop. And I'm easily recognisable in town, so people will generally speak to me a lot. Um, and sometimes family say, "Well, why is that person saying hello to you?" I don't know. It's just, <laughs> just it's just the family trait that we. It, 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 in all just me, it'd be it would be my grandmother, my mum. We've just got one of those faces that people want to speak to you and, and uh, ask how you're doing. It's just I've become. As a as a kid, I probably went, well, why is this random person talking to you? To now, it's it's I've got no problem. To I think a couple of years ago, uh, I was waiting for a train that was delayed, and we I got chatting to this random person, and he was like, oh, are you okay with talk? Because I had my headphones on, be it <laughs> like most people nowadays. Yeah. Uh, and we got a chat, and he's like, "Oh, you can go back to your music if you want to." It's like, "Hey, no, I'm quite. I'm going to have a conversation for thirty minutes. Um, I might, I might, I might. I'm gonna probably benefit from more from than listening to my music." So I can't remember what the conversation was about, but those are things that my family have always been able to do. It's, it's. Yeah, I'm in the big city. I'm in New York, and I'm in Brooklyn, and people speaking to you just randomly is kind of strange in New York. Uh, but it's funny because we, do say, we don't say good morning to everyone. We'll get on a train and you won't say good morning. No one will speak. But there are things that will happen that you automatically start speaking. If you see someone being harassed, then everyone will speak up. It's very opposite of, of what you experience. And, it, you know, they say New Yorkers are rude. And it's when I don't consider us rude. We're just, we have a different way of expressing ourselves. I think every city, I think every city is like that. It's, 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 if I go back to traveling back down to London versus coming back here, I'm two different people. Cool. It, it's <laughs> traveling back up here. I'm a little bit more chilled, a bit more laid back, and okay, if I've got if I maybe had the time, I might help. I might have helped a tourist going the opposite way. No chance. Nice. <laughs> it's, I've got to get from A to B. And I want to get to there as quickly as possible. Um, but that's, 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 you could say a mindset. It, it's, it's a habit and some, it's an, it's a behavior. It's, it's a shift. It's, you adapt to wherever you are to what people do. If we go to the south of the U.S., everyone walks, says hello, good morning. Like they don't know you and they, they wave, how are you? And just by passing. And at first it seems strange. Like, do you know that person? And it's like, no, I don't know that. Everyone does that. So sooner or later you start saying good morning. And you start waving hello to people you don't know. But like you, when I get back to New York, when I do that, people look at me strange. Like for the first couple of days, I'm like, hello, good morning. And they're like, do I know you? Like, oh, I'm back home now. I need to adjust. Yeah, so how does your family celebrate all these things that you're doing? This is where being half British doesn't help. It's it's like it's no... I, I'm not going to blame the family. I think it's just a British stereotype. It's like no big deal. Um, and it takes... I think 
and it's somebody external from the family to remind me what I've actually achieved. I think I did one, I came back a couple of years ago, uh, and my mum knew the uh, deputy mayor at the time, um, and the and I'd been so I've been to as a result of that, I've been into uh, the Palace of Westminster. I invite of of, of our what you call it you could call the equivalent of the a senator or or, or 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 member of Congress. Congress. And locally, people were like, "Well, what have you actually achieved in in the ten years that you did sport?" I was like. I'm going to have to sit down and actually really think about it. It was a two-page document. <laughs> but because I've lived it, it's no big deal. It's like, well, what have I really achieved? It's like, okay, I've actually achieved quite a lot. So, t- okay, the two Paralympics is the, probably the top, the, the, the icing on the cake. I've been, I've been, I won't say fortunate, I worked hard to get to four world championships. I've been to a continental tournament. Um, the only thing that's eluded me is the equivalent of the the Pan Am Games, and I've kind of gone, well, okay, you may have, you you're not going to get that on on, on your list. That's, that's, it's not yeah, it's not going to make or break uh, me. It doesn't individual. detract from what you've accomplished. No, not not at all. It's 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 more. It's actually more difficult as a disabled athlete than as an able bodied athlete to make that competition, which is ridiculous. Um, it, it, it Based on the closest I've ever, ever got would have been as a swimmer. And it just happened to do that event what, that they selected for the competition. I had the world record holder in there as well. So you, it was based on a, a proportional percentage of that world record. And in, on reflection, it was harder to make that competition than the Paralympics. That shouldn't be right. It should be, it, it's viewed for the able bodied as a stepping stone. You do that competition and you might make the Olympics. Okay. For the Paralymp, for the, for the disabled athletes, it's like almost the, the opposite. If you're not going to win it, you're not going to get selected. Okay. It's like, well, this is, this, it, it, I could throw my toys out and say that's not fair. It's not right, but, Hey, that's that. That's life. Will there ever be a parallel one for just the disabled athletes? Probably not in my lifetime. But uh, I joked around and said, "Well, I was a spectator. What would have been twenty years ago, and the competition is this year." So I kind of went spectator. We've almost made it, and it's like ten years. So I was a spectator in Manchester in two thousand two. I competed in London. And the the Commonwealth Games uh, would have been in Birmingham this year. So I was thinking, well, if you make it, 10, 10, 10, 10. Um, but obviously for, for work commitment and things like that, to put myself out of the team. So that's not going to happen. So I'm likely, I'll probably watch it on the television. But I got it close. I probably got closer than I ever did to making this team. So I was like, well, you, you, you've given it. <laughs> your best um circumstances have taken over because my 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 business is my living so that needs to come first um i'm i'm quite happy that i gave it a good i gave it a good shot and okay it's not worked out it's not gonna it's not deflated me in one, one way or the other it's probably given me uh momentum really to 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 go back into the the five on five game and and I've I've I want to say I've got so I'm more aggressive as a player overall and I've I've got better as a result of the the three on three version and the the the, 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 the club that I represent now has benefited from it. I, I also do as well because I've used and used the eighteen months two years hiatus that we didn't have sport. Hey. I can re I can refine my love and what I was passionate about as a kid, and going to practice is not a big deal for me anymore. It used to be a massive big deal because I, I I wasn't playing a lot. Whereas now it's like, well, it's your reprieve or respite from work. You're gonna go and do something that you enjoy, regardless of the time, regardless of what you do. 
and I and I thoroughly enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy, and I like and I like sport again versus maybe what, ten years ago towards the end the back end of my my uh, high level career I started hating it. It's like this is a job. It's so wrong on so many levels, but I'd lost sight of why I got why I loved it so much as a kid in the first place. It's like well, you're in a fortunate position to be able to travel the globe to to okay the, towards the end we didn't get paid very much but you, you you're in a fortunate position that people would probably buy your hand off for it it's like you're right. doing something that you love not everybody gets to be able to to experience that i get reminded that a lot from my family is like hey it's, it, not everybody gets to do a job that they love you've still got to pay the bill so i try and take both like well i'm going to do something that i love and i'd rather and be able to and then also get paid to do it because then it's, yeah. it's a it's it's swings and roundabouts and it goes both ways we i'm helping all other people yeah but then what happens with the jobs that nobody wants to do you know, well, you know those don't is, get this done is how, this is how i think about it there are people who like to do the jobs that we don't like to do there's always someone but they might be doing something else because they're not get that's not a well paid job, right? So we always have to go up against for are we doing a job we love or are we doing a job that pays us well so that we can take care of our living? I think if we were in a society where that's an there's you know, take away the money, you're going to get paid equally for the job you love, I think a lot more people would do that. I don't care if it's from cleaning the sewers. If I'm paying you adequately and you don't mind doing that, you would do that. But we have to make a choice a lot of times, right? It's either get money so I could take care of my family. And we've all done that at, at certain points in our careers where we, we come up against that choice. And I know, especially today, when the cost of living is so high that we tend to gravitate to, you know, I don't love this job, but it pays really well. I see during the pandemic, more people are regressing to doing the jobs they love. They're saying, I don't care how much this job is paying me. I want to do something that I truly like. And for the people who can work from home and do their jobs from home, they are taking that opportunity and saying, hey, I have no reason to travel two hours to get to work when I can do the same job from home and actually like it much better because I'm not aggravated by the time I get there. So there's so many levers to pull about which job you take. And that's the world. That's the world today. So tell me, James, uh, what are you doing? Do you do anything with children? You know, and you have the empowerment coaching thing. Do you give that back to children who are in need of empowerment or are those just with adults? That's a great question. Uh, it, de it depends. It's generally the parents that come to me to, that, to say that they're, uh, I spoke to a teenager uh, I think it was last year or the year before that was going through some struggles with it to come to not come to terms with the, the having the impairment, but being a typical teenager and not knowing where he fits it in. And and the the mother asked, "Oh, can, can you? I I could see you, you're quite open and being vulnerable with your story. Uh, I'm quite open with the teenagers, especially. Would you mind speaking to him? Like, Ain't no problem." Obviously, he spoke to me per, by himself because yeah. uh, the mom didn't want to be feel that she was looking over his shoulder. Um, and obviously, I've spoken to him. Um, I've been asked uh, recently to do a speaking engagement in April to the well, what is called the limb different community, but it's, it's congenital um, community uh, to be able to speak to like give maybe the kids a how would i describe it a look into the future of what's possible it's more probably for the parents to kind of go away i've done this 
the sky's the limit. So for me, the, the, to be able to speak to the next generation is very humbling, and, and, I, and I quite, I'm quite open to do it when people ask. It's like, well, I, I, coming back to your point about money, y- yes, ideally we, I, w- I would like to get paid for the speaking gig, but if the funds aren't there and the budget's not there, I'm not going to turn right. it down because it's like, well, I don't know what impact I'd make on those people's lives just by speaking to them to, and, and them to have be able to have a a, a discussion with me. Uh, whereas, obviously, maybe in the past, if we go back to my days uh, of finding role models that were similar to me, non-existent, I, I, I couldn't name you, I can name probably the bigger superstars within the Paralympic movement as a kid, and that's about it. I didn't know anybody... Uh, that was and similar to me. And they were not me. accessible to you. The bigger oh, social platform. media didn't exist. It right. was <laughs> the internet was. This is going to show well, show my age. Dial up internet. But some people say that doesn't. Oh, because I worked in a school uh, momentary for a little bit as well. And these are teenagers. Oh, dial up didn't exist. It's like, well, how do you get from then to having a computer okay. in your hand? Yes. It's got to be. It's got to be an evolution of something, uh, of that. And I think my role models, yes, they were sport. They were athletes, but um, I think I, I definitely could say my mum was one of those because she went out of a way to be able to put me in positions at the beginning. To okay, I, I found them somewhat cringe at the time. But she was willing to do a sacrifice to be able to put me in a position to to speak to the right person, to look on the internet, to to the point that uh, the person is the chairman of the Paralympics GB now, but he was head of British the British Women's Disabled Program. If I don't know how they found out, but he rang my mob at work, so. She's knocked on enough doors to the, the top person wants to know who I am. And I was wow. 15 years old. So it's like, I think f- for f- the gentleman in question is visually impaired. So I think f- for him to hear that I was on the team sheet probably for London and I made my second one, I was like, oh, God, the, the, this guy is fully realizing the pet- potential. No, no, there's no, there's no chance that if you say to me at, 14, 15 years old, James, you're going to be a Paralympic. I would probably wouldn't believe you. It's like, well, nah, that's not possible. That's not me. Um, but I wasn't scared of the uncertainty. It's like, hey, this is new. This is novel. I'm going to climb the rung, the, the, the ladders of the, the climb the, the rungs of the ladder and see where it takes me. So I, I try to showcase that now in my coaching. It's like, well, you know, what if is, it goes in both directions? You've got a negative and you've got a positive. Which, which I know, which I know, heart to heart. Even people listening to this, which people would probably prefer? They probably go in the positive every day, every day of the week. Um, but if if you do have a negative circumstance occur, the what if is going to occur, and you're going to relive, you know, past past mistakes, past failures. And I've done we it. We always done. learn a lot from or from the negative. We tend to learn a lot more from the negative than the positive. Well, for me, especially because I went to to university. The university I chose was based on sport. I was dropped from the program within three months. So, I I I. Were you not performing well? Like, why were you? Well, every year you you you're put under the the spotlight anyway, so you've got to hit you got to hit time, and if you don't hit that time, uh oh, oh well, you're not good enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Um, How did you cope I, with that, Miss B? I was all right because I saw it was this, the year before it nearly happened anyway, and. Uh, the the our development officer already know that I'd been selected for the team. He told my mum, and he told my mum, "Don't tell James, and he might perform." Perform worse. Uh, and then that that year, 
well, in my last year in high school, I was distraught. It's like, oh, I've blown it here. I'm, I'm. This is this future I I've envisioned of going to to to, to be the best athlete I can be. And maybe with the Paralympics is is gone. I've blown I've blown it out of the water, and there's no chance of coming back. How did you recover? How did you recover to go back? Well, you told you you're on the program. I've probably gone, gone from one emotion to probably very, very, very annoying. That's for sure. It's like, well, if you knew that I were already selected, I'm not be performing because of the pressure of, 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 of the thing mounting up to perform. You would, I would have thought you would relieve. I, I, I know why sport does it, but you would, I would think, try to relieve some of that pressure, not give person a false hope, but kind of go, well, there might be like a 50-50 chance. I bet you I would have done better. So the following year, I, I already seen it on the right and on the wall, on the wall, because it's like, well, I, 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 well, I already, my first couple of years, a uh, couple of years, couple of months in, 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 in my dorms at, at university. So for me, I'd gone in the summer to prepare to try and make uh, the competition the following year for the, for the Welsh team. So I'd already, for me, it was probably a blessing in disguise because I prepared myself for moving away from home already. So that was disastrous because not being in familiar surroundings, uh, I'm pretty much only having sport. It was quite lonely at night. So my performance that summer was horrific. Uh, but when I came back home and went, well, when we were still living in Belgium, it worked because the performances started were started falling into place. I swam a couple of competitions before I went back, but came back to the UK to go to, 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 into my first year, and I was swimming as fast as, as I ever have done. So it was like, well, all I had to do was plunk plunk myself into familiar surroundings, and it worked. Yeah. So that. That first couple of months at university, I'd I'd see people my same age struggling to, to 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 kind of find their feet. For me, hey, I've already done it. I spent three months in the summer holidays, uh, acclimatizing. This being away from home lark is easy, um, but the the sport didn't work. I ran out of time. Really, uh, my coach i still speak to him periodically he he was willing to work with me once i was dropped uh the the, the, the governing body said no chance you can't it's like no it's it's not your job to 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 get james back to but the other person was willing to do it out of the goodness of heart. it's like well if you're willing to do come in maybe earlier uh, and fit around when it's not national pro- program time. No, he's he's, 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 that, he's just that kind of person anyway. Um, and we break your your stroke down back to the bare bones of it, and then work back up. Um, but we didn't go. I didn't ever go down that route. But I bumped into him in the village uh, in Beijing at, at the games on the off chance, and it's like, well, you've materialised. The the that's something I he saw. And then when I was a swimmer, I was like, oh, okay. And for me, that was moment monumental because it's like, okay, I belong. I belong here now. And the game, the games are not that difficult. It's like I just needed that. Oh, not really reconfir- con- being reconfirmed, but kind of going, well, okay. I, I, I've trained under this person. About six months, and then uh, periodically I would come back in in the holidays and train with him as well. So probably oh, I've known him, I've known him since I was seventeen years old. So I've known I've known him a long, long time now. In the end, but it was just that additional belief to kind of go, "Hey, you've got this." So, do yeah. you think he was an inspiration to you that he kept helping and you know making sure? 
did he inspire you to continue or was there anyone who you looked up to and said hey i want to be like that or you know this person's motivating me to i i i think because how disability sport is organized even though and i'm retired now and i'll still speak to some of the guys that are, well one came out of retirement and competed in uh, the winter game just gone so but even though we compete in different sports it's like one little family so you want to emulate somebody else so uh the person in question that was his six games i spoke to him after what would have been is second, I think, if from if I can calculate it right. So I wanted to be. Oh, it's like, well, you've done there and got this, got the t-shirt. Why can't yeah. I? So I think you, it, it rubs this off. T-shirt. No, but as in, you know what the saying is in terms of, I, I, you've got it. Why can't, why can't I? If I, if I have a copy myself, if I model myself, not copy, but model myself on you. Chances yeah. are, You're generally well. they'll work out. So it's very easy once you make the, the team because you know you, there's, there's so many there's so many familiar faces anyways oh i already know uh if we if i use london as the example i knew about 10 15 people already because i because i pretty much see them weekly on a weekly basis so it's like well i know you you can be you, we're wearing the same track suit i know you from <laughs> over there and I've known you for a long long time so it, it's one of the things that the other home nations say England, Scotland are envious about because like if we had something like that what would we be it's like well we're like a little a little country that's the underdog anyway yeah. so we <laughs> make life easier for the athletes and they can use each other to bounce off to kind of you know, better themselves yeah. little by little. It's it's going to pay massive dividends in the long run because it's like, well, people have seen what others have done. So, okay, one of the athletes particularly has gone back in and on his development. Um, well, he was the development officer. I think he's the the perf now performance performance director. That's somebody that's been there and done it. So for for the next generation, the questions are easy. It's like, well, why am I doing this? Because it's gonna work. It might not be because you don't you don't want to do it, but this this is tried and tested and it works. Right. You just got to believe in the process. Uh, so for me, for me particularly, is backward engineering that from from for people within my business as well. Okay, why was I successful? I'm, I don't want carbon copies of me, but what can I extrapolate from me and give to other people that that may have a, like have a missing piece here or there? I was like, well, if I input this, hey, you're going to make massive leaps. You're going to make momentous swings. Um, so, um, is that what you want to do with your coaching to help them to get to that point where they can? My 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 grand vision is to go with public speaker. So I, I don't want to be doing, you know, one-to-one -one coaching forever. I want to be speaking to hundreds, if not thousands of people in one go. Have you seen the... Kevin Robbins? Yeah, yeah, well, he's taking to another level. We're doing it virtually. So it's like, yes. well, okay. Okay, that's a little bit more. That's a bit more. No, I don't see why not. Uh, and and I'll, I'll listen to, to his content. I'll consume it. Uh, I will take uh, of what i will and be able to put it into that is relevant to say my my yeah. audience right now uh, and and be able to kind of go well doo -doo -doo -doo. well I, it, the best one i've listened of late is where you 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 put your focus is where the energy go where your energy flows that's makes it's common sense but does do both people look at things like that not really yeah. Because if if I told you you focus on something negative, your energy is going to be bad. You're going to yeah. be angry. You're going to be sad. You're going to be frustrated. This is something that you're excited about. Hey, I'm happy. We don't think about it. That's true. But if I got people to be aware of what they were focusing on, 
it's a ma- massive shift in their state state of mind and, and yeah. their behavior as a result. So what's next for you, James? Oh, good question. What's next? I was asked, I think it was on a podcast, when are you going to do a TED talk? So and the next one. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I don't know. This, 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 for me, I think the sky is the limit. It's this, the only barrier that I can put is on myself. It's like, there's nothing. St- okay. The financial things will stop anybody in their tracks, but only I can be the undoing of that. If I, if I'm in a, um, a mindset of, you know, the law of attraction, if I've got a right, the right mindset, hey, that stuff's going to come to me. Yeah. Uh, whether, whether or not you're religious, you believe in like higher power, et cetera, things are not a fluke. Obviously, when I was in sport, I don't want to give it all the power of what I sense is a book, uh, the law of attraction, but it well, worked out. It is true. The more you do, uh, actually, it makes total sense to me. The more you put yourself out there and the more you do, people will see it and will give you more of that, right? They'll say, oh, I saw James speaking. Let me invite him to speak someplace. And the more they see you on your podcast, then the more you'll get invited to speak, whether for money or for free. But it's going to come to you. Well, it's just step. taking step by step by step. It's, it's, it's more... My, one of my clients brought it up the other day. It's like, well, I don't want to. This is him, not him, not me speaking. I don't want to put myself in a position that if I get too excited about it and some of it falls through, it's like, well, that's not a good mindset to have either. Because if you're not excited, that, that, yeah, yes, things might fall short, but you can reanalyze that and tweak certain things later on down the line but it's like you've got you've got but that conversation helped because the the scenario happened where uh he was organizing an event uh, a taste a day for 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 paintballer uh, for paintballers for for amputees and the venue's fallen through so he kind of got this is very he got really angry but he kind of went stop Let's park this thing. It's, it's not ideal, but let it not affect my weekend because right. you're going for a paintball tournament. Right. So, but he doesn't have that conversation with himself unless I bring it to, to the fore to kind of go, well, you need to maybe have a... It's more of an American approach of I'm the big I am. Not every American is like that, but it's, it's, it's a stereotype. Um, and... To follow on from that, I had a conversation with my dad weeks ago about it. Like that's a particular topic, um, and those quite philosophical. Because after he retired, he went into counselling. So with those our chats now as adults, is quite yeah, just if I was record those would be quite interesting. Uh, and he was saying for him, I was surprised because it's like, well, he's an American. He wouldn't he want to garner the, the spotlight and kind of shine it on himself. And he went. No. It's like James. No, if the spotlight wants to shine on me, I'll take my my place at, at the podium. But that's my choice. It's it's. I'm gonna choose when it's time to do that. It's like, okay, that sounds like me. Yeah. There's there's some <laughs> there's some there's some similar. There's my mom would probably say there's more similar similarities between me and my dad than than, than I would probably say. But that's one. I was like, okay. I'm somewhere in between. I'm not the this, this stereotypical Brit that I think most people that watch me are like, they're surprised. Well, why are you so comfortable in front of the camera? Right. Well, it's a number. The, the other end of it's a number. Okay, I've gone live streaming now so I can see people comment and things like that. Yeah. But that doesn't bother me. It's still people's questions. It's as long as I can stay on topic and I deliver the value and I give you what you want. Absolutely. It's, it's not that difficult. I'm talking to a computer. Yes. Two-way conversation is a bit easier. 
but it's not that 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 big a deal. And I helped out. I'm part of a local camera club as well, and we had a portraiture night uh, on Wednesday. I hate actual taking portraiture <laughs> pictures, but I'm more than happy to be in front of the camera. And they're like, "Well, you're," I think it's the chairman of the club. It's like, "Jim, you're quite photogenic." It's like, "Well, I've loved to be in front of the camera since I can remember." Probably more so as a kid than now. I I'm a little bit more susceptible to. You know, I'm gonna look at every every aspect of. I know we all. I don't really look really right in this picture. This yeah. this thing's never gonna see the light. I'm like every other adult who adult on the planet. Whereas back in the, as a kid, if the camera came out, hey, where do you want me to pose? Just play, yeah. And that's exactly <laughs> the, it's to to a certain extent. I'm still like that in some scenarios of. I'll do voice notes to people, especially the, Amer- the Americans like how, how Brit sound anyway. It's like, oh, I love your voice. Okay, that's that's amazing. That's good. I've, I'm quite an attractive person. So I've used in every as- attribute that I've got. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say my, my dad doesn't look too bad for 70, but I, I'm not, I'm going to lose some aspect of that as I get older, but trying to use every every single thing that i've got on my disposal okay looks is 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 great uh yes you could probably leverage that on camera um your voice i don't i've never i don't always like the sound of my voice um i won't listen back to my podcast at the very beginning because it's no it's cringe it's cringe no it's just i think it's just because of the, the 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 standard that i set now that's like long, long, I don't think a long lot of people like their voices. I I tend to do that when I listen. I'm like, oh my god, my my voice is so highly pitched. And well, know. it's interesting what other people think. It's like, oh, you you sound like uh, what, I think the best one I've heard of late from from a Brit within my audience was, oh, you sound like an American. It's like, I, t- I bet you the Americans. Oh. Are so it's just that, that there are certain words that. If I watch it, listen to it back or watch it on playback, you can hear a little bit of a twang. But there's other aspects that it's not. But this is, um, I think, we were talking about the disability. As a teenager, my voice was something else because in an ad- in a conversation with adults, I would talk, well, I wouldn't talk like this, but um, my, my, my voice has dropped since, since I was a kid. But obviously, I was speaking a British accent with the adults. But speaking an American accent to the kid, and what was I? I think it was I kind of decided my senior year is like, well, I'm just going to be me. I'm going to talk, and people were surprised. Well, why is your why is your voice changed over the summer? It's like, no, this is how I talk at home. I'm not I'm not going to put this facade on it anymore. I don't need to, um, because that's the same with I went to the school with another Brit. It'd be you'd make it slightly. I didn't. I just like well, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm not gonna fit in anymore. I'm gonna be me. I'm 18, 19 years old now. I'm gonna be comfortable uh, with me. Hey, if you don't like it, I don't care. Um, And obviously, once I've come into coaching, I've changed things because people will put me on a pedestal because of the sport. I was like, well, how do I? bridge that gap so i became more vulnerable and showing my flaws as well. okay this might be the, the the pictures are all around me it's wonderful that i was able to do this and it's 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 a passion at the end of the day because it's, it's it, i'll do it without question but what can we do that other people that might not be sporty detest the sight of i gotta be and people are very surprised like well how are you be able to be that vulnerable because it's not a big deal. I've dealt with that. Uh, I know people are going to relate to some of the, the 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 stories. I'm quite comfortable to do it, and if, and if I can bridge the gap to that, now you can relate to me. Win win, yeah. and then we go in the direction that I we, we, a positive direction. That okay, if you wanted to, I've spoken to a few recently who want to go to the Paralympics. Oh, I'm the right man then to speak to because. 
I I I don't know how to get there. There's no guarantee that exactly. you 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 will do it, but if you ask me the right questions and I point you in the right direction to get the right people, you two well, will be there. You 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 two could probably possibly make. I'm, I'll say probably. I'll say possibly make that a reality. Yeah. Well, James, it's been great. It's been great talking to you and hearing your story. It's an amazing story, and you're definitely a model for overcoming and for understanding how to utilize your own power and your own strength, not only to share that with other people, but to improve yourself. And that's amazing. That's a true gift. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for coming on my podcast. It's been my pleasure. No, it's my pleasure. And if you need a favor in return, I'm more than happy to do that. My podcast is called The First with Dr. Sandy because I really enjoy speaking to people who are doing things, are being the first, leading the way in what they do. But it's very important to me for them to give back as well. Now that you've been the first and you've done it, to show others how to do that. And I appreciate that. That's my, pl- my pleasure. So thank you. I don't know what time it is there. I don't care what time it is there because <laughs> you made the time to do this for me. Oh, I like coming on podcasts. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. This is Dr. Sandy. Thank you so much for sharing your journey on the first, where no two stories are alike, even if the circumstances are similar. Let this discussion serve as inspiration for others to show what's possible, and more importantly, to produce seconds and thirds.